straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Carol Baskin praises a deputy's level thinking for responding to a tiger on the loose, and his alleged owner denies it's his. This man had absolute nerves of steel. Sean, aka Sticks Larkin, joins us to discuss his new podcast, Cop Tales, and gives us a preview of his interview with a 91-year-old police officer with no plans of retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Most people know me. Prosecutors rest their case in the trial of a former deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists. Plus, the trial of three former officers charged in the death of George Floyd gets delayed until next year. And our coverage continues in the motion hearing in the Ahmaud Arbery case, the evidence the defense wants in and kept out of trial. You're hearing it now from me. It's not about the credibility of Ahmaud Arbery. I'm Brian Buckmeyer. Co-host Terry Austin is on assignment covering the trial of Zachary Wester, where the prosecution has rested in the trial of a former deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motors. Terry explains. Zachary Wester is facing 67 charges, including racketeering, possession of a controlled substance, and false imprisonment. The charges are related to allegations of planting drugs while he was out on patrol. And for one Florida motorist, it was a traffic stop that changed his life. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. This is former Jackson County, Florida, Sheriff Deputy Zachary Wester, as he searches the car of James Spears. I mean, I like to hum a tune in case something ever goes in front of the jury, you know. Wester reportedly stopped Fears while his wife was driving on June 4th, 2018, for a problem with their license plate tag. What we got there, my friend? Look at there. Oh, All right. Both yards can be detained at this time, okay? I can undetain you. I just can't unarrest you. Wester places James and Jade Fears into handcuffs. The deputies explain they found dope in their vehicle. Had you ever seen anything like that in your car? No, sir. Had you put anything back behind that front, um, the front passenger seat? No, sir. Fears admitted on the stand he was convicted of four felonies. He knew both Wester and fellow deputy Trevor Lee from prior encounters. Fears was arrested for possession of meth, but weeks later, prosecutors dropped the charge saying the case could not be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. On cross-examination, Fears told the defense that he didn't see either deputy plant anything in his car. Do you have a civil suit pending in this action? Yes, sir. Okay. And you sued Zachary Wester? Yes, sir. And Trevor Lee? No, sir. No, sir? Just Zachary Wester? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Anybody else? Sheriff's Department? Sheriff's Department. On redirect, Fears explained why he's suing Wester and the Sheriff's Department. Because I sold every damn thing I had to keep my roof over my head. <clears throat> I sold everything I had that was worth anything. You told the deputy on that video that you were going to lose your job over this and that you felt it was wrong, correct? Yes, sir. You still feel that way? You yes, sir. You still feel like this was wrong? Yes, sir, it is wrong. Wester has pleaded not guilty, and his defense attorney says he will take the stand when they present their case for Law & Crime Daily, I'm Terry Austin. Thanks, Terry. Joining us today is trial attorney Jamie White, along with the host of the newest podcast on the Law & Crime Network, Cop Tales, Tulsa Police Lieutenant Sean Larkin. Now, Jamie, the defense is going to recall one of the witnesses and two officers and actually anticipate Wester to testify. What kind of defense could we be looking at here? It's going to be a circus, Brian. Uh, you know, it's very unusual. It's very unusual that a defendant testifies in his own defense. And here, I can't think of anything that Mr. Wester can say that is going to assist him. You know, they found an extraordinary amount of paraphernalia in the back of his police car that could have only been used to assist in these unbelievable crimes. Um, so. You know, I, I suspect there, the, it's a Hail Mary to find some sympathy in the jury. They only need one or two people to find that, you know, he's a nice guy and maybe a perverted point of view was doing his job and therefore doesn't deserve to go to prison. But um, it's a very bad choice, in my opinion, on part of defense counsel. Now, Sean, I'm seeing a lot of the prosecution using 
uh, I, think the, I think the best way to say it is, is juxtaposing Wester, who they identify as a bad cop, with good cops like yourself, and trying to really drive home the emotional impact of saying, like, this is the one we have to go after. Do you think that's a smart tactic by the prosecution of showing this is the bad apple to try to remove from the tree that is uh, law enforcement? Uh, sure it is, because I think the overwhelming, uh, you know, number of people in the public, they know police overall are good, hardworking guys that just want to keep these communities safe. And I can tell you, there's nobody that wants a dirty cop gone more than the good cops that are out there. And so by portraying, you know, showing this guy is the bad apple, hey, this other unit investigated them or this group investigated, investigated them, they themselves want to get him out of here. And I think it's a great tactic. Yeah, I think it's working out very well. We're looking at a lot of our chatters on, uh, on YouTube at Law and & Crime commenting on just that. And Sean, thanks for joining us because you brought a sneak peek from one of your upcoming podcasts, and this story really moves me. Let's take a listen to this interview with a 91-year-old police officer in Arkansas, and you can tell us more on the other side. Well, as long as you've been on the job, I assume you get a lot of respect, don't you, sir? Yes, sir. <laughs> If you pull somebody over, they get out of the car, come back, and grab the ticket, and then get back in the car and drive off, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Most people know me. When I stop them, they ask them, buckshot. <laughs> you know, I know everybody from maybe five years old up. I helped a lot of people. Sean, that was a great interview. And I actually saw one of your episodes, really interesting. I'm a little jealous because I can see in the background there that you actually get to share a drink with some of your guests. You got to tell me how you got Dan to agree to that. But tell us more about this officer who's not planning on retiring anytime soon. Yeah, so Buckshot, he is actually, uh, as of yesterday, 92 years old. So we did the podcast yesterday with him. We kind of got to have a, a celebratory drink. Uh, he himself does not drink, but we had one in his honor. Um, but yeah, he's been in law enforcement. Uh, this is his 57th year now. He did 46 years with the sheriff's department. He retired and was gone for about five months and he just missed it that much that he then got hired by the local police department and he is on his 11th year there now. And just as he was talking about, he pretty much knows everybody in that community, um, you know, from, from five-year-olds on up to full-grown adults. And he's kind of a celebrity in that area because he's been there so long. Absolutely. Now, Sean, you may be retiring before Officer Smith, but you still have plans to serve your community. Tell us a little bit about your plans after retirement. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually proud to say tomorrow is my last day on the job here in Tulsa, uh, about a 25-year career here. Kind of scared, but I'm looking forward to some of the new stuff going forward. Um, just as we talked about, the podcast uh, is something I'm really excited about. You know, the name is Cocktails. I kind of unofficially call it Cocktails and Cocktails. And my co-host, who you saw there, is Howard Doss. He's an ICU nurse. Um, the two of us are big bourbon collectors. And so the idea behind each show is going to be a casual conversation about a serious profession. The two of us are going to sit down and talk with police officers, informants, convicted felons, uh, pretty much anybody that's touched the law enforcement world through the years, and just try to talk to them about their story, uh, but done in this casual conversation while we're having a drink. Um, got a book coming out next month that I've also partnered with Dan Abrams on. Really excited about that called Breaking Blue. And I'm actually going to volunteer and work with a cold case unit here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, that kind of looks into some of the older unsolved homicide cases. Well, Sean, if you ever need a public defender, Woodford Reserve is my drink. Thank you very much for joining us. I've got you, buddy. All right. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the perfect expert weighs in on the... Welcome back. Major news out of Minneapolis, where the trial of three officers charged in George Floyd's death is delayed until March 2022. Law and Crime's Angela Levy is here with that, arguments that took place about a leak and a claim that the medical examiner was coerced. Yeah, Brian, a lot going on in Judge Cahill's courtroom for this hearing. He has actually delayed that trial, he said, in part because of pretrial publicity and the fact that all three of the officers and Derek Chauvin are facing federal civil rights charges. 
Former Minneapolis police officers Thomas Lane, Alex King, and Tu Tao will not go on trial in the death of George Floyd until the federal civil rights case has been resolved. Defense attorney Joe Tamburino practices in Minneapolis. The feds have to prove specific intent. Not only did they intend to do such and such acts, but they did it with the specific intent to deprive Mr. Floyd of a specific constitutional right life, liberty, due process. I think it's all a heavy lift. A new controversy has erupted over this New York Times story published in February. Law enforcement officials were quoted as saying Derek Chauvin planned last summer to plead guilty to third degree murder in Floyd's death. But Attorney General Bill Barr stopped the deal from going forward. Former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi expects a tense hearing over the leak in August. There are very strict uh, customs and practices with respect to what you can say about a, a potential guilty plea or trial. Minnesota Assistant Attorney General Matthew Frank said in court that it appears U.S. Department of Justice officials leaked the information. Judge Cahill agreed. Meanwhile, the attorneys for the three officers have filed a motion claiming prosecutors coerced Dr. Andrew Baker, the medical examiner who conducted George Floyd's autopsy. They want the charges dismissed because of it. I think it's sort of a misguided motion. Tamburino says the claim will not result in the charges being dismissed. The defense claims forensic pathologist Dr. Roger Mitchell, who volunteered to testify for the state, pressured and threatened Baker to include net compression in his cause of death ruling after Baker told him he saw no signs of asphyxiation in Floyd's body. The Minnesota Attorney General's office called the claims bizarre, false, and wrong in a letter to the court. If it did occur that he was lobbying him, Mitchell was trying to work the umpire to get him to change uh, a call from a ball to a strike or safe to an out. If it appears he was trying to do that, that looks horrible. Now, the defense attorneys are also asking for sanctions to be levied by the court against the prosecutors involved in this case. Now, I contacted Dr. Roger Mitchell. He is a professor at Howard University. He told me in two emails that he would not be participating in any stories about this topic. And I also contacted the spokesperson for Dr. Baker, the medical examiner in Hennepin County, and she told me that they will not be commenting on any pending litigation. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Let's bring in trial attorney Jamie White. Jamie, Dr. Baker being pressured in how he made that medical exam report, it, I've never heard a kind of allegation like that. I would say it's bizarre as well. But if true, how does that play out for the three officers and even Chauvin? Well, I think it's subject to interpretation, Brian. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing you know, extremely unusual about prosecutors working with their detectives, their officers, their experts and challenging their conclusions. This happens. You know, they're, the prosecutors are working from a multitude of sources, and each individual source um, can arguably contribute to the next. And so in this case, the idea that Mitchell and the prosecutors had, took some exceptions with the, um, with the finding of the forensic examiner, I, I suspect what they're going to argue is that his findings were inconsistent with what all of the evidence suggested, in particular the videotape where it was clear that he was suffering um, from the knee on the neck. So I understand why they're making the argument. You know, they have to do something, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, but I think the, the likelihood of it having any um, significant impact, I think, is relatively far-fetched. I, I agree with the prosecutor's response. Now, and Jeanette, Cahill was kind of on the fence about subpoenaing the reporter who made that article because of First Amendment issues. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, well, obviously, Judge Cahill was furious that that information came out right before trial about a potential plea deal with Derek Chauvin. And, you know, it really endangers his right to a fair trial. Now, bringing in witnesses and having them testify or fill out affidavits, people who work in law enforcement who may have been part of this to see whether or not they were part of the leak, that's one thing. But putting a reporter on the stand and grilling a reporter about who their source is is pretty un-American if you think about it. There's, we're part of the fourth estate, you know, journalists. We're supposed to be holding the government accountable and we're the watchdog for the people. So putting a reporter on the stand and forcing them to reveal a source, I can see why Judge Cahill would have some heartburn over that. 
it is a First Amendment issue, and it's really not the reporter's fault. It's the person who leaked the information. Exactly. Let's see how that plays out. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, should Amont Arbery's mental health records be allowed in at the upcoming trial of three defendants? Plus, out on the prowl, police in Houston continue to look for a missing tiger. Carol Baskin's reaction to how an off-duty deputy handled the big cat you don't want to miss. back. A man accused of evading police after a tiger got loose from his house has posted bail. Angela Levy is back with some thoughts for some thoughts from a tiger expert I think you'll recognize. Yeah, I think our viewers are definitely going to recognize her, Brian. Carol Baskin, she owns the Big Cat Rescue in Florida. She's also one of the stars of that hit Netflix series, Tiger King. Now, Baskin told me that she was actually very impressed by that off-duty sheriff's deputy who pointed his gun at the tiger earlier this week in Houston but didn't shoot. That tiger wandered away from a home in a neighborhood, and it had been in a home rented by a man named Victor Cuevas. Cuevas claims self-defense in an unrelated murder case. He was arrested on charges that he evaded arrest for possessing that tiger. Now, the nine-month-old tiger is named India, and he remains missing. The only reason that the cat didn't kill the guy with the gun or end up being killed trying to was because it was nine months old. It's still a baby. And that cat will be growing until it's four or five years old. That's when it becomes sexually mature and becomes an adult and in the wild would kill its own parents to take over their habitat. So, you know, that's, you know, anybody who thinks they're going to raise that cat up and it's going to love them like a parent for its entire life is doesn't know anything about tigers because that's not how they work. Now, Carol Baskin, she's actually offering a $5,000 reward for the safe return of India. And Cuevas' attorney, he says that he actually doesn't own that tiger. He said it actually belongs to a man named DeAndre. Brian? And Jenna, I never thought Carol Baskin would be an expert on police use of force on a tiger, but here we are. <laughs> what else did she say about finding this missing tiger? Well, she's glad, you know, she wants it found because she said there are places that will take care of this tiger and allow it to live in the wild. But certainly, you know, a tiger should not be kept in a home. It's just not the proper place for it. And it could harm somebody once it gains sexual maturity, as you heard. Absolutely. That's best to keep everyone safe there. When we come back, back into a Georgia courtroom for the second day of testimony and a hearing for the Ahmaud Arbery case. The evidence the defense is trying to keep out on trial next. Welcome back. Day two of motion hearings in the Ahmad Arbery hearing as the defense attorneys for the three defendants are asking a judge to admit Arbery's mental health records into evidence. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael are charged with murdering Aubrey while he was out jogging last February. A third man, William Rody Bryan, is charged with boxing Aubrey in while filming the incident. The defendants claim Aubrey was a burglar running through their neighborhood and say Aubrey's mental health records show his response was to get angry and aggressive. Aubrey was on probation at the time of his death and prosecutors say those records are privileged. They're claiming self-defense against a man they did not know. A man who they saw running down the street. We've got about a 10 minute incident Mr. Arbery says absolutely nothing during that entire 10 minutes. So when they say, I was acting reasonably, that has absolutely nothing to do with Mr. Arbery's mental health. It is not critical to their defense. It is okay to recognize and celebrate who Ahmaud Arbery was in 2012 when he graduated high school, but it is reckless to disregard the mental health illness that plagued him for eight years leading up to this moment in February, of tw tw February 23rd, 2020. The defense is also trying to keep jailhouse calls made by the defendants out of the trial, including one where Gregory McMichael can be heard agreeing with his brother that no good deed goes unpunished. I got my mask on and everything. I'm trying to sleep, but I can't. It's just, you know, I wake up every 15 or 20 minutes, you know, because you, know, you bothered me. You've heard Dale saying uh, no good deed goes unpunished. 
Well, yeah, that's it. That's the best shining example right there. The state portrayed the meaning of that to be the good deed is the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. Being punished for is what's happening by being charged and incarcerated, which is not what Mr. McMichael meant. He meant patrolling his neighborhood and trying to capture someone suspected of crimes in the neighborhood as the good deed, the being punished for it was then being charged with murdering him. Let's bring in Jamie White one last time. So the fence is trying to keep some information in and, and keep some of it out, but let's speak specifically. Do you think there's even an argument to show some relevance to Aubrey's background to bring it into the case? No, my, Brian, and I don't believe that that's really their goal here. Um, I believe the defense is purposely, arguably, trying to um, paint the public picture and, and the jury pool with a dark side of um, the victim in this matter. You know, anybody that's attended law school and has any relative experience trying cases knows that the mental health records of an individual that's been murdered are not relevant. You know, he could have been, um, had the mind of a two-year-old. But it wouldn't have changed the facts of the situation um, as, as they lay here today. So I think they're acting in bad faith, and I don't believe in any world that we live in, legal world we live in, the judge is going to allow these in. Now, I also know the judge is going to rule later on that, as well as whether or not the jailhouse statements will come in. We'll make sure to follow up with that. Jamie, thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Network. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.